I'm show, showing people uh, the right way uh, to be a leader, the right way to pass on a message. And uh, we know for a fact that uh, Abdullah bin Abbas, he takes this to heart because he can see through the body language of the Prophet wasallam that the Prophet wasallam is saying this out of concern. So the Prophet wasallam he, he turns to this young boy and he says, Ya Ghulam, O young boy. And in some narrations it says, Ya Bunay, that the Prophet wasallam said to uh, Abdullah, uh, oh, uh, my young son. And this is just a way of showing extra affection uh, to pull the hearts close to you. And this is the practice of the prophets, alayhi uh, We spoke before about Yusuf, alayhi salam, who is in the prison with other prisoners who committed, uh, you know, actual crimes. Uh, some of them might have been murderers. Some might have done uh, other things. But the, uh, that Prophet Yusuf السلام, when he speaks, he speaks in a gentle tone. So from that we learn a great lesson. It is that in Islam, when we speak, we make sure we know who we are addressing with the speech. Because each uh, statement, uh, it has its place. <coughs> and by that I mean, you do not speak the same way when you're in front of your parents, you don't give your parents the same advice that you would give uh, your uh, friends. It might be the same advice, but it's certainly not with the same tone. Uh, and the Prophet وسلم, he's showing the way, uh, an appropriate way for uh, a grown person to interact with a young person. Sometimes we, uh, in our cultures, we have this perception we think that, you know, we push young children to the side, right? Some of us, we think that uh, children should be uh, seen but not heard. Yet here we see the Prophet wasallam not only in this situation, but many others, the Prophet wasallam would actually engage them in conversation, right? And now if a person has a conversation uh, with a young person in the community, People might find that strange, but yet it is not strange. The Prophet ﷺ asked young children, uh, you know, uh, what happened to your pet bird and so on. And he had conversations with young people. And he would even, the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned in the authentic sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ, he used to uh, uh, place his hand on young children, right, on their heads uh, to show affection in an affectionate way. And the Prophet ﷺ would go and visit children. He would go and visit children, and especially if they were sick, he would take that uh, as an opportunity to show them, to make dua for them, and to visit them in their homes. So this is just a glimpse into what made the Prophet ﷺ uh, such an amazing uh, character. So here you have the Prophet ﷺ speaking to this young boy in a very affectionate way. Imagine being the age of Abdullah bin Abbas and a person like the Prophet وسلم, is turning towards you and giving you his undivided attention. This is a very great thing. So Abdullah bin Abbas is taking all this in and he's memorizing it. And the Prophet وسلم, tells him, Inni I will teach you a few words and other narrations <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ puts it uh, in a question, in a questioning form. Do you not want to know of a few words that will benefit you? So again, you see the way that the Prophet ﷺ is talking. Uh, it is in a very easy going way. It's, he's not making the situation bigger than it is. But at the same time, he's making sure to pass on that critical, that important knowledge that Allah has blessed him with. So the Prophet وسلم, teaches this young boy the kalimat, the words. And the first thing that the Prophet وسلم, says is, Be mindful of Allah. How is a person mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, the scholars in Islam have explained this and they say, make sure that you safeguard 
the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you to safeguard. Protect those things. And what are these things? There are many different things in the religion. Uh, if you think about it, what is the most important aspect, practical aspect of the religion? It is the salah, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal, when He speaks about the salah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, with no unclear terms, حَافِظُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَالصَّلَاةِ الْوُسْطَى Make sure that you protect and you safeguard your prayers. And Salatul Wusta, the middle prayer. The scholars in Islam, most of them, they've said that middle prayer is Asr. Right? Because during Asr, it is a time where people usually get busy. Either you're at work or you might be at home. Uh, and it's more likely that you forget that. Uh, or you, either you forget it or you delay it. So because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned specifically out of all the prayers, the middle prayer. So prayer is a, a part to safeguard. Another thing is Allah Azza wa Jalla when He speaks about the uh, the vows, the promises that we make. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, "Wahfabu uh, aymanakum." Protect these vows, these promises that you make. How much is a promise worth today? You know, even if a person says, uh, "Wallahi, I will do this," or even if they don't say "Wallahi," if they say, "I will do this," there are very few people who follow through, right? And the, the, the best of people is the one that says, oh, I forgot. But here, Allah Azza wa is telling us specifically, make sure that these vows, especially when the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned, that we take those serious and we protect them. So if you protect or safeguard these hudud, these limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed, you do the things that Allah Azza wa Jal has commanded you to do and you stay away from the things that Allah Azza wa Jal has told you to stay away from, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling you uh, Allah Azza wa Jal will protect you in return. Now how does Allah Azza wa Jal protect a person? The scholars in Islam, they mention two main ways. Two main ways that Allah Azza wa Jal protects a human being. The first way is connected to this dunya, meaning in a literal sense, Allah will protect you from any evil. Evil will not come close to you, and Allah will protect you from disaster. And this is if you're mindful of the duties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the other way that Allah protects the person is in the akhirah. That if you fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah azza wa jal will uh, grant you his uh, uh, blessing, meaning that you will attain Jannah in the Akhirah. Uh, Allah azza wa jal, when he speaks about the other people <coughs> before us, uh, Allah azza wa jal said, Ya Bani Israel al-Kuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum wa awfu bi'ahdi awfi bi'ahdikum. Fulfill my promise and I will fulfill the promise that I made to you. And you fulfill the promise that you made to me and I will uh, fulfill my promise to you. Uh, in other places, Allah Azza wa Jal says about uh, the believers, Remember me and I will remember you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said this, this is not the only place, there are many other places throughout the sunnah and throughout uh, the Qur'an itself where Allah Azza wa has given this promise. <coughs> and one interesting thing is that it's actually been reported by the scholars in the past that you would see sometimes a scholar who might be close to a hundred years old, a okay? hundred years old and he is moving about uh, in a very youthful way. One particular one, one of the scholars in the Shafi'i Madhab, uh, Ibn Abi Shuja' uh, rahimahullah, it was said that he reached a very high age, close to a hundred. And even at that age, people used to see him, his students would see him climbing up trees and coming down trees, in a very youthful way that you won't expect from someone that age. And the people asked him, they said, how come you're moving like this? And he said, 
I practiced the hadith of the Prophet When I was young, I made sure to follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I protected myself from evil. And in my old age, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected me in return. So this is a concept that you see not just with him, but in many other uh, cases as well. <coughs> now, protecting yourself from a young age, it is something that is good. But it might be that many of us, when we look back at our past, especially in our youth, we might feel some kind of regret that we did not uh, fulfill this part of the hadith. But even then, a person should not feel that sorrow, that sorrow that uh, makes them uh, lose hope. It should rather be uh, a push for making things right. The scholars in the past they used to say, when shaitan reminds you of your past, remind shaitan of your future, that there is still time, that there is still uh, time for tawbah. So, the Prophet وسلم, he carries on and he says, uh, Be mindful of Allah and you will find him in other narrations it says Amamak, in front of you. So what does it mean that you find Allah in front of you? It is not in the literal sense that you, Allah is in front of you, but rather what it means here according to the scholars in Islam is that Allah Azza wa Jal will bless you in a way where uh, He gives you more tawfiq, more ability to do what is right. Uh, so if you do one good deed and you stay away from bad deeds, Allah Azza wa Jal will help you by enabling you to do more good deeds and so on and so on. Uh, you see this with the prophets of Allah uh, salam, again uh, Yusuf alayhi salam when uh, he found himself in that very difficult situation. And Allah says, كَذَٰلِكَ لِنَصْرِفَ عَنْهُ السُّوءَ وَالْفَحْشَاءِ And in such a way Allah diverted from him the evil and the fahsha. So this shows that Allah is with the person. And there's an important uh, point to mention here. When we say Allah, or when Allah is with someone, uh, this is of three types. Okay. The Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ And Allah Azza wa Jal is with you wherever you are. The scholars in Islam, they say this means بِعِرْنِهِ Through his knowledge. That Allah Azza wa Jal is with every single person through his knowledge. Allah Azza wa Jal knows whatever is happening. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, Do you not know that even if a group of people were to gather, three people gathering in a secret council, that Allah is there and He is the fourth of them. If four people gather in a small council, secret council, then Allah is the fifth and so on. That Allah is uh, everywhere through His knowledge. And it is important to mention through His knowledge because some people they believe that Allah is physically everywhere. But the pious people before us, they made it clear. They said, Allah Azza wa Jal is as taught in the Quran, Ar-Rahman al arsh istawa That uh, Allah Azza wa Jal is above his throne. But he is everywhere through his knowledge. And the other form of ma'iyya, of being, Allah Azza wa Jal being with someone, it is through uh, helping them. Okay? Uh, when Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal is with these good people, it means that Allah Azza wa Jal is helping them, that Allah Azza wa Jal protects them from evil. And the highest level of ma'iyya is reserved for uh, the prophets and the very, very pious people, where Allah Azza wa Jal grants them uh, mu'jizat, uh, miracles, things that uh, normal people uh, don't uh, get. So this is important to know, these three types of ma'iyya. An important point to mention here as well is as parents or concerned individuals, uh, 
in a community. Many of us, we worry about the future generation. We worry about our children. If we don't have children ourselves, we worry about the community as a whole. Today, the community, mashallah, they have a masjid, they come, they pray, uh, they fulfill the obligations in Islam. But what will happen a generation from now? What will happen two generations from now? And you see this worry uh, even with the prophets of Allah alayhi salam that Ibrahim and Yaqub and these prophets before they passed on, before they uh, died, they would call their children and they would ask these important questions. A lot of people in the community, they come and they say, Imam, now I've grown old, I am weak, I am worried about my children, both spiritually and financially. What is the best way to make sure that I leave something for my children? When I pass away, who will look after my children? How can I be sure that they will remain the same way that they were when I was alive? Who can help them if they find themselves in financial difficulty? And there is an answer to that. And we have the answer in this hadith and in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that if a person fulfills their duties to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the person, but Allah azza wa jal will protect their descendants. In Surah Al-Kahf, and we've mentioned it before when we went through the tafsir of that surah, when uh, Khidr and Musa alayhi salam, when they meet that, uh, those two orphans and they restore and they're able to get that uh, kens, that uh, treasure. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions <coughs> specifically, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا And their father was Salih, he was a pious man, he was a good man. Now, the tafsir is that it was not just their father that was pious, but the person that is mentioned here is six, six generations back. Six generations back. So, subhanAllah, imagine you doing good deeds. Not only your children feel the effect, the blessings of those good deeds, but the uh, their children and their children's children and so on and so on keep feeling the blessing of that and it is mentioned by some of the tabi'in uh, the students of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, one man in particular he used to say to his son he would say I am increasing my prayer I am increasing my prayer I'm praying extra for your sake. What does that mean? It means that I am increasing my prayer, hoping that Allah Azza wa Jal, through this prayer, will protect you. That Allah Azza wa Jal makes me a pious person. And in return, Allah Azza wa Jal has promised that He will take care not only of the pious person, but of their descendants, their children, and so on. So, this is one of the best ways. This is the, uh, an insurance plan where there is no riba in it. There is nothing haram about it. It is a very practical way. And it should be something that we keep in mind. Because when we, we're pious, when we try to be righteous, we are not the only ones that reap the benefit. When you're good to people, when you do righteous acts, you benefit, people around you benefit, and generations down the line will also benefit. <clears throat> and then the Prophet said, <clears throat> sa'alta fas'alillah. When you ask, and notice how the Prophet he kept it open-ended. 
Not when you ask about religious matters or you ask about akhirah. No. When you ask, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, we see the opposite. Everyone has problems, but where do we go when we have problems? Many people, they confine with the Imam. But by the time they reach the Imam, or they start praying or seeking a religious uh, answer, they have gone through so many different things. Very few people turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as soon as something happens. And this is what separates people. And again, I want to make it clear, Islam has nothing against seeking professional help. And we'll come to that in a little bit. If a person has a medical issue, the Islamic thing to do is to make dua to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for shifa, for a remedy, to become well, to be cured. And once you do that, you go out and you seek out the means. You contact doctors, you take the medicine that is prescribed. This is the Islamic way. We do not have uh, blind faith in the sense that uh, Islam stops us from seeking uh, professional help. Let's say you have a problem within your family or someone is threatening you and you're worried about your own safety and the safety of others. The Islamic way is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you and your family. And at the same time you go and you seek out the necessary authorities and you protect yourself. But the problem is that people, they leave that religious aspect, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the last option. When everything else fails, when that lawyer is too expensive, when that doctor has written uh, a bill that you can't pay, then the people come and they knock and they say, Shir, what can I do? But the Prophet sallallahu advice is, that this should be the, the, the thing that people do uh, as soon as it happens. When you need something, and it's been mentioned by, uh, in some of the narrations that the companions of the Prophet <coughs> they would not ask anyone for anything to such an extent that even if they needed shoelaces, something as simple as shoelaces, before they would go and buy something or look in the market, they would make dua to Allah. Oh Allah, give me this. And then they would go out and seek out the means. So this is something that, uh, especially in our generations and uh, people of our times that we lack, that we always make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion an afterthought. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to this young boy, billah." And when you seek aid, when you seek help, seek it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we've mentioned this before, but we will repeat it. When it comes to asking for help, there are certain conditions. Scholars in Islam, they've said, there's four conditions in order to make sure that what you're asking is halal. The first condition they say is when you're asking for help, the person that you're asking for help, they have to be alive. Okay. It makes sense if you think about it. Only living people can help you. But why, why is it important to mention this? Because it puts a barrier between the correct way and the way that might lead to shirk. If you go to a grave, regardless if it's the grave of the Prophet وسلم, or Abu Bakr or any other uh, pious person, and you ask them, then you have not done it in the correct way. Even the companions of the Prophet وسلم, when the Prophet وسلم, was alive, they would, they used to ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to make dua for rain. 
But once the Prophet ﷺ passed away, they stopped asking because the Prophet ﷺ was not there. So they would go and ask the uncle, Al Abbas. And they would go to him and they used to say, when the Prophet ﷺ was alive, we would ask him, but now he is no longer with us. So we ask you to make dua uh, on our behalf. So the person has to be alive. Another point that the scholars in Islam mention is the person has to be uh, able. Okay. What you're asking has to be something that the person is able to give you. If I go to a brother and I say, can you lend me $200? That is a reasonable request. But if I go to a person and I say, uh, you know, my child just died, la qadar Allah. My child just died right now. Help me bring my child back. Then is that a reasonable thing? No. You've given this person an elevated position and this is not allowed because the only person or the only one that can bring the dead back to life is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whomever Allah Azza wa has granted that ability to. And then the scholars in Islam, they mention that the person uh, has to be present, have to be habib. Why? Because even let's say the person is alive and they're able, but they're not here in Victoria. There's some sheikh somewhere far away in some other country. If you don't call or you don't uh, send a message, you've given this person supernatural, uh, super, supernatural powers. How can this person hear you? Right? So this is important. And then finally, you have to believe whatever help that you're getting is the, it is through the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah Azza wa Jalla is the one that is giving this person the ability to help you. Even if it's in minute things, small things. And helping each other, there's a tremendous reward in it. The Prophet Sallallahu said uh, a very beautiful hadith about a simple thing such as loaning, you know, lending money. The Prophet Sallallahu said, if you lend your brother in Islam money, and the person pays back and then they ask for the same amount later then the second time around even if the person pays it back Allah writes that down as sadaqa so let's imagine a person asks for a thousand dollars you say brother I need a thousand dollars you say no problem here's a thousand they pay back that's a good deed Next time the person comes and they say, I need a thousand dollars again, and you give them and they pay you back, it is written as if it was a sadaqah that you never received that money back. It's even higher of a reward. And this is just a simple thing as lending. Imagine all the other things that we do. A person needs a ride. A family is sick. People help with translating. People dedicate their time. They give their money. All this is helping each other. So, just to make it very clear, it is not the helping that is uh, haram in Islam, but it is the nature of that uh, request. And even if you need some help, even if someone else is able to grant you that, let's say it's just a money issue, and you know that the person can help you, the best way is to turn to Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal is a razab. So why go to someone who is a human being like yourself before asking the one that is uh, a razab, the one that has bounty with, uh, beyond uh, end? So the best way as a Muslim is you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you never know. You think a thousand dollars, where am I going to get that from? But when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you never know. Someone might call you tomorrow and they say, Oh, uh, so and so, I, I just remembered, I owe you a thousand dollars. Here. 
And this is all from the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, like I said in the beginning, we will leave this uh, last portion of the hadith until tomorrow, inshallah. But I hope that this first portion of the hadith uh, made sense to people and that they took some benefit from it. And again, remember the context. When we learn about these hadiths, there's so much wisdom, so many lessons that we should try to implement. This is the Prophet وسلم, talking to a young boy. It should make us, uh, it should help us put that into practice. That when we see children in the masjid, we should try to have a conversation, or at the very least, try to educate them. We should not have the mentality that this is not my child. This is someone else's child. They won't listen to me. Have you ever tried talking to the person? So if, like they say, it takes a whole community, a whole village to raise a child, right? It's not something that a parent can do by themselves. And if we help each other to make our children practice Islam in the correct way, then little by little we will see the change. Today we hear about these horrible attacks in different places. And have you noticed a pattern that every time these individuals do this, the people that are behind it, the perpetrators, it's the same story. They didn't know much about the Quran. They didn't know anything about hadith. They just started practicing recently. They didn't come from a uh, uh, religious family, household. And if the community isn't there to guide the younger generation, then it is just a matter of time before people will take knowledge from the internet. They take knowledge from wherever they can find. So it is our responsibility that we invite the youth to the masjid that we invite the younger people, that we help them connect, not just with the Imam, it's not just one person's responsibility, it's a community, it's the responsibility of a whole community. So inshallah we will expand on that in the future, uh, and with that we will conclude today's uh, class. If you have any questions, now is the time to ask.